Good evening. Is it, is it working? Do you hear me? Yeah. Do you hear me? Selene, is that okay? Okay. Good evening. My name is Shai Ginsberg, and I'm a professor of Israeli cultural studies and Hebrew in the Department of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies here at Duke. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker for the evening today, Yakir Englander. Uh, on behalf of the, center of the Duke Center for Jewish Studies, Duke Islamic Studies Center, Duke Women's Studies, Carolina Center for Jewish Studies, UNC Department of Asian Studies, Carolina Center for the Study of the Middle East and Muslim Civilizations, and the du Duke UNC Consortium for Middle East Studies. Dr. Akir England Englander is a specialist in modern Jewish philosophy with a focus on gender issues and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. His PhD from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem um, in 2012 is in Jewish philosophy and gender studies. His dissertation, The Perception of the Male Body in Ultra-Orthodox Society During the Last 60 Years and Its Ramification for Understanding the Human Subject and the World, offers new understandings of the images of the male body in Jewish ultra-Orthodox contexts in recent decades. Engander's research is interdisciplinary, touching on the interfaces between Jewish philosophy, Jewish law, and gender studies. He has authored articles on sexuality in Judaism, on the role of the body as a mnemonic in the work of post-Holocaust writer Aaron Appelfeld, on shame in the Talmud, on the body of the Hasidic tzaddik, uh, sorry, and on the body of the Hasidic tzaddik. His first book, co-authored with Avi Sagi, examines aspects of the religious Zionist image of the body and sexuality during the last decade. His second book, on the perception of male body in ultra-Orthodox thought, will be published in the Hebrew University Press. Engander is interested in interfaith dialogue and the role of religions in the Israeli-Palestinian con Palestinian conflict, as well as theory and practice of non-violent social change. He has been developing understanding of these issues through his volunteer work as director of Kids for Peace in Israel and Palestine, a member of the global interfaith dialogue organization Kids for Peace International. In 2011, he received the Berlinsky uh, Scheinfeld Award for Change in Israeli Society from the Israel Con Council of Higher Education for his work in Kids for Peace. Today, he serves as the Vice President of Kids for Peace International and works with Muslim Christian Jewish leaders in Israel and Palestine and in North America. Responding to tonight's lecture will be Abdullah Antep Antepli, Imam Abdullah completed his basic training and education in his native Turkey. From 1996 to 2003, he worked on a variety of faith-based humanitarian and relief projects in Myanmar, that is Burma, and Malaysia with the Association of Social and Economic Solidarity with Pacific uh, countries. He is the founder and executive board member of the Muslim Cha uh, Chaplains Association and a member of the National Association of College and University Chaplains. From 2003 to 2005, he served as the first Muslim chaplain at Wesleyan University. He then moved to Hartford Seminary in Connecticut, where he was the associate director of the Islamic uh, Chaplaincy Program and Interfaith Relations as well as an adjunct faculty member. He previously served as the Muslim chaplain at Duke University. His current work at Duke, uh, in his current work at Duke, he engages students, faculty, and staff across campus through seminars, panels, and other avenues to provide a Muslim voice and perspective to the discussions of faith, spirituality, social justice, and more. He also serves as a faculty member in the Divinity School and at Duke Islamic Studies Center, teaching a variety of courses on Islam. So please help me welcome I uh, Imam Antepli and uh, Yakir Engelder. Good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. It's a very hard day. 
it's a very hard day for me personally to speak, um, to be coherent um, after the event of uh, this morning in Jerusalem. It's a very hard day for me to, to speak today when the people who were killed in the synagogue are part of the community of my parents and of my sister. It's very hard for me because the father of um, the father-in-law of uh, my sister was on the way to the synagogue. He was almost on the entrance when he heard the shooting, so he ran away. And his wife, she saw everything from the window. It's very hard personally for me more than that because one of the rabbis who were killed uh, today uh, was sitting next to me for three years in uh, the yeshiva, the institute where I learned Torah. I tried to touch the holiness in Jerusalem. Three years I was sitting next to him, as I said before, next to Abdullah, my brother. And I learned from him how a human being who works very hard on his personality sit and learn. It's a beautiful thing. Just to be next to par such a person. What a blessing. But because of that, I feel that it's my responsibility to speak today and to speak from my heart. Maybe it will be less coherent, which will give my soul um, less structure. And I will try to speak and to touch very hard subjects that we thought to, to think together and to open to, to you and to the community. I am very thankful to, university of, to Duke University and to Shai and to my friend and my brother Abdullah for agree to create such an event. And I, in, in, as a Jewish tradition, we say, I hope that the words which come from the heart will come, will, which go out from the heart, will come inside the heart. And to come, to, when the words transfer between people, it doesn't mean that you need to agree with me. To the opposite. As a traditional Jew, a person who grew up in a Hasidic community, which is one of the three main sects of the ultra-Orthodox Jews in the world, one of the things that we learn very, very much from very young age is not to agree with someone, but not to agree with love. And what I call an intimate critique. An intimate critique, people can say there are two kinds of critique. There is critique that we can say to someone who is my enemy. By the way, it's very easy to critique my enemy. It's also very easy to critique people who are not part of the, I mean, to critique places which are not next to us. It's much easier here, by the way, to, to people to critique what's going on there in Israel and Palestine. It's much harder to critique what's happening in South Chicago. As someone who just spent his last two years in Chicago, trying to be as much as I can next to really holy imam who work in the communities down South Chicago, I learned what is a I learned that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can learn still a few new steps from Chicago. And, and uh, again, it's, uh, it's wrong because we do not compare. But what I try to say is that one of the things that I learn is to critique mostly myself. Sometimes when I speak, people come to me and say, hey, Yakir, I mean, it doesn't make sense. You, 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 you sound as a Hasidic Jew, but you critique as a self-hater Jew. And my answer is that I don't know, I, I seriously, I feel that to critique the other will not help. I, I, d I don't say it's not needed. Thanks God there are tons of people who like to critique the other. So what I try to do is to critique myself. Seriously, it's a self-mirror to my personality and what I try to do. Now, another thing that I learned from one of my very, very close friends who works with me, Pastor Josh Thomas, who is with us. He is the Executive Director of Kids for Peace International. 
I learned that don't critique until you have an alternative. And when he told me that in different words a few years ago, I remember one of the very special figures in the Jewish tradition from the 19th century, the Chafetz Chaim. And the Chafetz Chaim, the rabbi who wrote the book Chafetz Chaim, who which means in Hebrew, desire for life, he said, never critique if you are not sure that the person next to you can listen to. Okay. By the way, there is another kind of critique, which is a cry. And I think that a lot of the critique that I hear from my Palestinian friends is not critique, it's much more crying of pain and this is something else and we must listen to that okay so this not doesn't mean to critique the other this mean to cry and sometimes the way how you cry you don't have the you don't have sometimes even the words it's a privilege to speak as an academic and to have the best words to critique right the cry is something else. And the Talmud speak a lot, the Jewish Talmud speak a lot about crying. And the Talmud said that even when the gate of heaven are closed, the gates of tears are never closed. And I just wonder how many tears of Israelis and Palestinians are now in heaven and how much pain we create to God who gave us the images of himself, herself, us. The title of our speak that I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes is about the connection of religion and violence. It's a very hard subject which we must learn to address. I need to learn to address. Now I'm going to address it as a Jew. I'm going to address it as a Jew who grew up in Israel as a Hasidic community, which is more complicated, because I don't know exactly what is Judaism. It's another question. Maybe my words will not be satisfied or recognized by many American Jews, because the gap between Israeli Judaism and American Judaism today is huge. It's huge. And we need to learn to listen to each other. It's another issue. But for sure when I'm going to speak today about violence and religion, I don't speak from the name of other religions. So I will switch it to Judaism and violence and the connection between both of them. They are, when we say today Judaism, we need to separate, and it's very important, we need to dig. And we need to separate between Judaism as a religion and Judaism as a culture. And it's not the same. And when we speak about the connections between violence and Judaism, we need to make sure that we understand that there is one question to Judaism as a religion, and on Judaism as a culture. It's different kind of understanding of Judaism. When many liberal Jews speak about Judaism in a Jewish language, for example, when they speak about tikkun olam, to repair the world, to make the world a better place. One of the questions that we deal a lot with rabbis, is it religion? It's not clear. When I say that I need to become a better person, you don't need to be religious for that. Okay? And when I say, when I call it tikkun olam, repairing the world, in a way, for many people, you don't need God for that. Just be human being. 
When people say no, but it's connected to Judaism, it's fine. But we need to check exactly where is the religious aspects of that. Maybe it is humanism in Jewish language. Okay? When I speak about religion now, I want to speak about this part of Judaism that humanity by definition is not enough. Therefore, they need God, according to their understanding. Okay? It's two different things. We need to learn and we need to make sure that we understand. Because many times, Jews who believe in humanity, which is a beautiful thing, they critique Jews who believe in their understanding of God, and they tell them, what you do is horrible. And they cannot listen, because they speak in two different languages. One speak in a religious language that humanity is not enough, and one speak in humanity language. And the connection of each one of them to violence is also different. So today what I'm going to do now is to make my life even harder. I want to speak with you about the connection which people do not like to speak so much between religion and violence. And I will give you an example from my life. I grew up in a Hasidic community, in a beautiful place where my life, I never studied in a high school, thanks God, and <laughs> which is a very, it's, it's a mysterious and, um, and maybe a miracle that I'm at Harvard. Um, and I, so I never studied in a high school, I still try to understand what's going on there. And then I study in a yeshiva, which is an institute that we dedicate our life, the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic men to study the Talmud, okay? Even Bible, we leave it to the woman. For us, it's the Talmud. We have one track in our mind. It's Talmud. Whatever the Torah said, we say the opposite. This is the idea of the Talmud. And, and in, in this amazing place, it was not just ultra-Orthodox, but it was also Hasidic, which means that we had our rabbi. And my rabbi was the, 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 the most beautiful person that I admire and love. And um, I, I was looking at him. I mean, he was our, actually, God served our, my rabbi, in a way. I, it's interesting. It's fascinating, the relation between the rabbi and God in the Hasidic tradition after the Holocaust. There is a lot of anger there about God, about the Holocaust. Therefore, the rabbi become even bigger. But let's leave it for now. You can call it idolatry. There is a lot of articles about that. Boring. Um, what I care is about relationship, right? I care about the relationship. It's a beautiful relationship. Now, I loved my rabbi so much because my father, who was the second person that I loved so much, loved the rabbi also so much. So in, from the age of five, every Shabbos evening, which is a Friday evening of the Jews, we went, after we went to shul and we went to home and we have our dinner, we went to the rabbi. Hundreds of Jews, Hasidic, come to the rabbi. And what the rabbi does, we spend four or five hours with the rabbi. And what the rabbi did in all these five hours, he didn't teach us any Torah. He did one thing. He ate. But for five hours, every Friday, I learned how a human being who tried to work on himself, how a person can eat. This is fascinating. He never took twice with a spoon from his soup. Each time he ate, put back, ate again. Everything we looked. Then we also sang, and we ate. And it was a beautiful, holy feelings between us. One thing that we had to do in order, now, by the way, all the Hasidim, it's hundreds of Hasidim together, all the time we touch each other. 
we hug each other, we dance, we pray, we cry. We did everything together, touching all over. One thing was not there. Women, they are not allowed to come. This is one of the reasons that I decided to leave the community, because of gender issues. Also, there was no place in such a place for homosexuals. The problem is that when I left this community, I went to all kinds of synagogue you can offer me all over. I never have been in a synagogue where men and women pray together that people cry so much. My father, after Rosh Hashanah, he called me and he asked me, Yakir, how was your Rosh Hashanah? I said, it was amazing. And he asked me, did you pray in a synagogue? I said, yes, part-time. And he told me, it was mixed synagogue? Mixed gender? I said, yes. And he said, and people cried? I said, no. He didn't say anything more. And then he said, this is why you, you, you prayed there just half time, right? Because you wanted to cry in another place alone. I said, yes. I went to the monk monastery, to the chapel, and I cried the second day of Rosh Hashanah alone. Now, how come that the Jews failed to cry together, men and women? I don't know. I'm not going to solve it now. I still prefer to pray in a place where men and women are together. I don't want gender separation in my life. It's hard enough that one side go to this restroom and second to that restroom. Enough. Halas. We have enough problems. I don't want women to be all the time behind the, behind. Behind the bus, behind the curtain. No, not in my name. But I never made a place where I can cry and pray. Holiness and violence go together. In my year, a few months before I decided to leave the community, I tried and I was drafted to the Israeli army and saw the most horrible things. I tried to go and live among the settlers. I had the very problematic honor of sleeping in a new settlement which called Gvaot for the first night. I was chosen as one of the first ten people who stayed at the first night of the settlement. The amount of holiness that we had there, I don't have in another place in the Jewish life the connection to the land, this fragile, holy, scary, sensitive connection to the land, I never seen it in another place. But, thanks God that I'm not there anymore. Because when I was there, I really believed that there is no one else in the area. I just forget all the Palestinians that we had to kick out from the area in order that we can sleep there. And now comes the question, what do we do? And this is what we try to do in Kids for Peace. One of the options is to say, you know what, I don't care. You do horrible things. I'm going to stop it. By the way, maybe it's right. This is the direction to do. My advisor in my PhD, she's one of the top feminist figures in Israel. She wrote the Israeli law for sexual harassment and she changed the law of rape. Thanks God. She said, if I would have the power, I would take your Hasidic community and destroy it. What you're doing, no, not you, me, but what my family is doing to women and the suffering of gay people, I, I, I will not let it happen. She's right, but she doesn't care about the holiness. 
Now, maybe she will succeed and I'm not God to judge. Maybe it's right to do it. Maybe it's better not to have violence and not to have all in us. But then, let's push it more because we also do a lot of holiness and violence together. Each one of us do it, I'm sure, in our par private life. But maybe we can do something else, and this is what we try to do in Kids for Peace. Is to engage the holiness, the unique holiness. And as a Jew, I can say that the holiness that we have in our Judaism, the parts of holiness that I learned from my Muslim friends, we do not have. Now, it's a big thing to say. I don't know if as Christian and Muslim you can, um, and, and Buddhist, I, you can say it. As a Jew, I can say it. They are, p they are different colors to touch God. They are different tastes. And by definition, by going to, to a synagogue, you don't know what does it mean to have a relationship with God in a mosque. By definition. The moment that I start living for weeks with monks, Catholic monks, I learned totally new color how to touch God. Thanks God that I had the chance to leave and to go to these monasteries. The beauty of being next to women who pray, maybe we don't cry next to each other, but the, the possibility to pray next to women who sing and pray with God and are not there on the other side, it's, it's a new thing. My Hasidic family have no clue what beautiful color women bring to the Reform and Conservative synagogues. What they know is that when they sit in the Western wall, they fight. They don't understand what they don't have. But what we do is the violence. And this is what we try to do in Kids Priest. It's one of the things. What we try is, to, what we created is a youth movement in Jerusalem where for six years, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish teenagers from the age of 12 till they finish high school, they join all over the year and they learn about their tradition and the other tradition. It's an interface dialogue, but you know what? Harder than that. It's an intraface dialogue. I will give you examples of Shia and Sunnah coming together. Believe me, Israel and Palestine, it's almost nothing. I will give you a Reformed Jew and an Orthodox Jew coming together. The hate that they have is you don't know what to do with that. And what we try to do is not to just show them how much violence they do to each other. What I try to teach my Jewish kids is that unless they watch how my Muslim children, how our Muslim children pray, first they don't understand anything about Palestinians. Secondly, by not listening to Muslim how they pray, they don't see new colors how to touch God. But this is not enough. This is the first part. After learning, experience by watching. I can go to a monastery. I don't let the kids, because the Jews need to be Jews, the Muslims need to be Muslims, the Christians need to be Christians. Very clear. We have responsibility for families. When they become adults, they will do whatever they want. But the next step is, What's happened to pro-Israelis, Jewish kids from Israel, when they met with Americans? What happened to pro-Palestinian Palestinian kids when they meet with, with pro-Palestinians here? What happened when the Palestinians meet with pro-Israelis here and the ex? So they come to summer camps in America and they meet with American interface but it's not enough. It's very easy to critique Israel and Palestine from here. 
but we need to gain credibility. I can critique all the world, but I don't expect the world to listen to me. Even if I'm right, always I'm right. The question is, what is my credibility? I can cry if I have pain. It's one thing. But if I want also to do change, cry is not enough, unfortunately. How do I gain credibility? And again, I'm going to critique only the Jewish side. You can do, is the, you can do the homework. It's not my job. How can people, Jewish people in America, can tell me, liberal, now, you know, it's very easy to critique the fundamental. Let's critique the, crit the liberal. How they tell me to meet with Palestinians when mo actually 99% of the rabbis, liberal rabbis in America, never sit to understand the pro-Palestinians who want to do BDS on American money, American money, let's leave the Israeli money, American money. They come to me and they say, but they are anti-Semitic. And I said, and what is exactly the Hamas? Is my best friends? You want me, Yakir, that my family today lost members of their shul, synagogue. You want me, Yakir, who served in the army and carried parts of dead bodies for three years and for 10 years in reserve, carried babies, by the way, both sides. You want me to do peace with people that I'm shaking and you cannot meet here? The minimum is that Hillel, APAC, J Street will knock on the door of justice for Palestine every day at least and beg them to learn together. This is the minimum. How it's not happening? So what do you want from me? What is the credibility here? How come that there is not an open dialogue about the, the amount of money who go to weapon to Israel? And I say it as an Israeli. We must open it. If you don't open it, who I am that I need to open things? I need to risk my family. It's my family. Listen, it's not settlers. It's my family because part of my family are settlers. I'm going to, I'm doing peace every day in Kids for Peace. I have here my witness, my executive director. I'm sacrificing my brother and sisters for the option of peace because my brother and sisters are not only my, bro my blood one. My brother and sisters are also Palestinians. Something break in my mind when I carried melting bodies of Palestinians and Israelis together. It changed my world. For me, I cannot divide between them. Why? Because I put them in the same box. So minimum that here we will have an open dialogue about everything. And then I can look at you and I can say, wow, you did it. You know what? I want to learn from you. This is also violence. I want to finish and to say that I see hope. I see hope in Jerusalem. I will not speak now about, about America. I will see hope in Jerusalem because of the less things that I want to introduce to what we do in Kids for Peace. And we can do it because of the beautiful American people who hold us when we are shaken and they help us to do it. I cannot do it without my American colleague. And thank you for that. In Jerusalem, we don't do only dialogue. It's not enough. Many people will say it's normalization. It's to make the horrible situation normalize. They are right. Dialogue, we tried, it doesn't work. Di 
דיאלוג cannot be the goal, דיאלוג must be a tool on the way. But the goal is to do change. And in Kids for Peace, we take our 16, 17, and 18 years old. And now we try it, and we are shaking. And we teach them to do with us non-violence action and practice. Do you know what is to stand in the middle of Jerusalem with signs in the middle of the violence that you are against violence? It's first, it's step one. It's just the beginning. We are now working and we get the permission of parents, holy parents, who maybe because of their involvement in Kids for Peace will pay the life And they, are, they let us to start pushing our communities to do change, to demand change. This is the next step. This is something that was not done before. And there is something in Kids for Peace that we can do it because we are also part of us religious people. I don't do it because it's normal. What is normal is to hide or run away from both countries. It's better to live in Tel Aviv, at least you are safe, and then to shout that you need to do peace. What is not normal is to keep living in Jerusalem and to fight to live together and to practice it. And to practice with children, what does it mean to come to a class and to say, "My best friends are Palestinians, Muslim, Christian, Jews, and to be kicked out from class. How you will react as parents when it will happen to your children? But you know what? You did it in the '60s. You did it when it was here, no black could study in the university, and you fight for them. Now it's our time to learn it from you. And I want to bless all of us that together with a lot of love and a lot of critique of love, we will also succeed to reduce a bit of the river of tears and to bring not just hope, but to fight to do change as much as we can. Thank you so much. Good evening, and assalamu alaikum. When I was signing up to respond to my brother Yakir, clearly I didn't know what was I getting myself into. And it's a tough, tough thing to follow, hearing somebody's pain, somebody's broken voice, and meeting with a holy man in the face of death, destruction, still speaking peace, And speaking moderation, common sense. Uh, so I'm deeply humbled. Thank you. My first response to you, the way we will structure the program, I will speak maybe about 10 minutes to respond, and both of us, we would like to answer your questions. Uh, I'm hoping we will keep your attention uh, and a little bit, maybe 10 more minutes, and then what time do we need to end the program? OK. Well, first of all, my first response is, I am my sincere condolences, my absolute sincere condolences to you, to your family, to your community, to your country, and I grieve in solidarity with you. I grieve in absolute respect and solidarity with you to these treacherous, senseless, tragic killings of four people in the house of worship while they were praying. I think this must be one of the lowest level of humanity that anybody can can fall into and this is worthy of condemnation and absolutely despicable treacherous acts that nobody should even come close to 
even justify with anything with the bigger picture goes on. The secondly, my respect to you that in the face of such a tragic, senseless, murderous act, instead of saying, I, am, I, I cannot talk, I can grieve, you have absolutely every single right to express anger, frustration. There was not a blink of that towards the perpetrators, towards their religion, towards their community. Absolutely nothing. I think you are exemplifying how to grieve and how not to lose the sense, how not lose the uh, point what we are dealing with here. Not allowing your grief to make generalizations that most of us do. And I have the world of respect that has increased in your voice of respect and your call for peace and invitation. The next one, I think if I understood you correctly, you profoundly invited us to a spirit of honesty, which lacks so much in interfaith conversations, which lacks so much in religion and violence conversations. If I understood correctly, you were saying a lot of us intentionally and unintentionally live in a denial that the violence that we experience in the world of Judaism, Christianity, Islam has nothing to do with religion. There are so many people who live in the denial, in my world especially. There are so many people who waste everybody's time saying religion is about culture, violence is about culture, has nothing to do with religion. They say to an effect that Islamic extremism or Muslim extremism has nothing to do with Islam, or Jewish violence has nothing to do with Judaism, or Christian terrorism has nothing to do with Christianity. If I understood you correctly, you were saying no. You have absolutely, you are inviting us to be honest. Let's acknowledge the problem that if you don't identify and acknowledge the roots and connection of Muslim extremism with Islam and Christian terrorism with Christianity and Jewish extremism and violence with Judaism, you are missing the whole point. You will sing Kumbaya, you will eat hummus and talk about halal and kosher, but you will make no change. You will make no impact in those violence conversations. As I often tell to my students and my community, let's be honest. I always remember the most uh, impactful Native American story where the Native American grandfather tells to his grandchildren. As you grow up, there are two wolves in you, says the grandfather. One is an evil wolf, bad wolf, and a good wolf. And these wolves will fight your entire life. The bad wolf and evil wolf will fight against the good wolf and the angelic wolf. And the kids curiously ask, which wolf will win? And the grandpa says, whichever you feed and nurture. Whichever you feed and nurture. So I think you are inviting us to acknowledge there is a bad wolf and a good wolf in each and every our religion. There is a good wolf and a bad wolf in our canonical text, in our Quran, in our Hadith, in our Torahs and Bible. But it depends on what you nurture. There are elements which could be used either way. The same verses which get me out of my bed every day, pumps fear of God and love of God to my heart, can pump hate and rage and destruction to other hearts. If I understood you correctly, you were saying, let's not make that distinction between religion and culture as we understand violence and religion. Let's not divorce ourselves from the theological and religious roots of the violence however perverted, however misused it may be, but the problem is partially religious. The problem is partially theological. Can we bring ourselves to acknowledge that, that religious connection so that we will actually solve the problem? I hope I'm not misrepresenting, but that's absolutely my, my take on the, on the issue as well. I would like to push back a little bit when you say you can, as a Jew, only criticize yourself and Judaism and it's not your job to criticize others. But I think, and I will end with this, I didn't realize I have already used my 10 minutes, and I really would like to see what the audience have been thinking. I think to me, one of the outcome of meaningful relationship building and interfaith dialogue, to establish the kind of connection and trust that we can criticize each other. And when we do, we can actually hear each other. And we criticize, it will come from a place of respect, curiosity, and constructive engagement as an intention, as a purpose, that 
we will not divorce ourselves from the responsibility that we will be able to play a good conversation partner role where we can actually criticize one another, criticize each other as well. The last, and this is really the last, I think you are exemplifying in your broken voice and heart, in your passionate and emotional delivery, um, that there is so much area of improvement for our ability to be a little bit more self-critical. We are wasting too much time when it comes to religion and violence conversations or the effectiveness interfaith dialogue or intrafaith dialogue where we don't do enough of self-criticism. I absolutely agree with that and I hope we can follow your example and be as self-critical but as a proud Jew you are exemplifying and modeling us. You can remain as a Jewish proud Israeli and proud Jew but be as critical as it gets. Be as harsh as you want to be as you fail your community is falling short in fulfilling and upholding their ethical moral ideals. Thank you, and God bless every single one of you.